Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Shortly, I am going to turn things over to Commissioner Batts and the Baltimore Police Department, who will walk you through some of the latest developments related to the death of Mr. Freddie Gray. Before we begin, I want to again offer my most sincere condolences to Mr. Gray's family and to his friends. I also want to reiterate our commitment to moving as quickly as possible to determine exactly how his death occurred. Earlier today, the Commissioner and I met with community leaders to discuss this case, and I'm looking forward to speaking with Mr. Gray's family soon. One of the things that we discussed was the importance of our efforts to continue to work together as we determine everything that transpired before Mr. Uh, Gray died. Many of the people in that room have worked with us over the years to continue reforming our police department, and they have worked tirelessly to help bridge the gap between the police and the community. This has not been easy work. It has been very difficult to overcome decades of mistrust. But together, I believe we have made great strides forward. However, it's still very clear that we have much more work to do. I'll never stop believing that we are up to this challenge. Baltimore has made progress before, and we've overcome difficult challenges in our city and I know that we will do it again. As we move forward with this investigation, it is important that we remain one community, and I'm encouraged by how peaceful the demonstrations have been. As we move forward, I continue to encourage those residents who wish to remain community is experiencing a great deal of trauma. And none of us get the answers that we need or that the Gray family deserves by resorting to violence. This is a very, very tense time for Baltimore City, and I understand uh, the community's frustration. I understand it because I'm frustrated. I'm angry that we are here again, that we have had to, to tell another mother that their child is dead. I'm frustrated that not only that we're here, uh, but we, do, we don't have all of the answers. I want to know why the officers pursued Mr. Gray. I want to know if the proper procedures were followed. I want to know what steps need to be taken for accountability. And if that happens and the facts tell us what we need to happen, that's exactly, um, you know, we need, to, we need to be able to follow those facts. And that's exactly why my focus remains on providing prompt and comprehensive uh, understanding of this incident. Some information has already come to light. Some of the information that is out in the universe is true. We also know some of the information that's out there is rumor. Um, but if there is one piece of information I want to speak about and speak about directly is the notion that Mr. Gray was originally pursued because he may have been in possession of a, a knife. We know that having a knife is not necessarily a crime. It is not necessarily probable cause to chase someone. So we still have questions, and we're moving forward with our investigation accordingly. I take very seriously my obligation of transparency for both the family and the community at large. However, we will balance that obligation with our obligation to ensure that proper and a, a proper and thorough investigation is undertaken. We will provide the community with all of the answers that the community, is, that the community deserves. We'll identify appropriate accountability if necessary, and we will continue to be aggressive and thorough with our reforms in the Baltimore Police Department. With that, I'd like to turn things over to, commission, to Commissioner Batts, who will give an update on our progress in the investigation, and he will address some of the immediate reforms that we've taken while our investigation uh, continues. Commissioner? Thank you, Madam Mayor.
As I said yesterday at the news conference, I shared the fact that I'm clear that a mother has lost her child. I'm clear that a member of our community is not here anymore. I'm also clear that my goal is intera interaction between the police department and the community. The goal is to walk to home safe for everyone. I am asking for calm and to allow the process to work its way through. The steps that will take place is that the police department will conclude their investigation or our investigation by next Friday, not this coming Friday, Friday after next. At the conclusion of that investigation, it will be forwarded to the state's attorney's office to which they will make a ruling whether they will file the case or not file the case. At the conclusion of that, uh, there will be an independent review board that I will call. This is the third of such independent reviews that we've brought people in from the outside to take an honest look at our investigation as a whole. We are a community that's on the edge right now. Our voices need to be heard. The community's voices need to be heard. And the most part is that we need to listen. We too are part of this community and we hear, I hear the outrage. I hear the concern, and I also hear the fear. I also ask for the media to also report in a responsible way, because we are on edge as a city, and I need your help to make sure that we get this out in the proper way. As people express their very real frustration in the coming days, we ask only that it is done peacefully. My model, my goal, my focus is a reverence for human life. That's in our policies, it's in my statements. I make it clear that we will have a reverence for human life. But it goes beyond just the mere actions, including the manner in which we conduct ourselves, is paramount. As we move with the urgency, and I do say when we move with a sense of urgency in our investigation, we will examine every piece of evidence possible, and we will go wherever the evidence takes us. Areas of concerns for me, and the Deputy Commissioner will cover some of these. What did the autopsy come back with? And that happened today. And what, what is the preliminary findings of that autopsy? Was the gentleman seat belted in the van per policy, as we relate? Was there a delay in requesting the paramedics at the time that we saw that there may be some serious issues going on. We will show you the video from the CCTV that was referenced and make sure that you get a copy of that in any other video that you wish to see. Was there any evidence of a use of force? Was there a tasing that took place out there? Did the body show any use of force of tasing? Was there any broken bones on Mr. Gray? Was there any evidence of kicking? punching, strikes of any type upon his body? Was there any evidence of the voice box being crushed for any damage done to the neck area? Was there any internal trauma to the organs at all? Was there any vertebrae that were broken in a manner that would cause the severe issues that we are dealing with today? We've all seen the videos, and those that, you, that haven't been seen, we will make sure that you get a copy. The actions of our officers appear to be calm. They do not appear to be angry or overbearing when we watch the video. They have no objection to the filming when it's taken place. That doesn't mean or excuse that nothing happened. It just recognizes the facts that are on the video. Other videos that you will see from different angles will show the same location, which leaves, which leaves all of us seeking more answers. As this investigation continues, we will take corrective action whenever and wherever it is necessary. If we see policies that don't make sense or out of date or antiquated, they will be changed quickly and immediately. If we find a procedure or a process that was handled incorrectly, we'll hold people accountable for that. We will train all of our officers to make sure it is remedied immediately. As a part of an ongoing investigation, I am ordering and I have ordered 
a number of policies to be reviewed and rewritten effective immediately based on national best practices. This includes our in-custody transportation procedures. It also includes the policies that address people in custody requiring medical attention. Anytime someone requests medical attention in any context, immediately we are to respond to that. I have directed our Professional Development and Training Academy to immediately start training tomor tomorrow to certify all of our officers who operate transport vehicles. We will ensure that they have the correct training. We will validate that they have been trained on first aid, CPR, the correct way to seat and house a prisoner in the transportation of a prisoner in the request of any medical attention whatsoever. As we continue the investigation, we will identify any other issues that come to light and bring them to your attention. If I haven't made it too clearly now, we're being as transparent as we possibly can. We will be open, we will answer questions, we will bring this information to the public. We will continue to keep the public and Mr. Gray's family informed at every step of this investigation as we are able. We guarantee transparency, and as the mayor said, we also guarantee accountability. But at the same time, we're not rushing to judgment before we have all the facts that came into play. I have directed my command staff to ensure that every resource available is dedicated to the accurate, transparent, and timely resolution of this investigation. We have started a new task force. The task force to review this is part of our force investigation team that investigates all force. Our crime lab will be part of this task force. Our homicide investigators, investigators will be a part of this task force. Our training academy will also be a part of the, the task force that will bring to the state's attorney's office in the week after next uh, the conclusion of all these uh, revelations. And again, to Mr. Gray's family, I extend my condolences to the citizens of Baltimore. We will get better. And to the men and women, at, in, in char the men and women who are dedicated to keeping the streets safe in Baltimore, we stand ready to answer questions. Deputy Commissioner Rodriguez. Thank you, Commissioner. And thank you, Madam Mayor, both for your leadership in these times. It certainly makes our direction and, and uh, what we need to do much clearer for us. My name, as you heard, is Deputy Commissioner Jerry Rodriguez, and I'm in charge of the Professional Standards and Account Accountability Bureau. I'd like to join Madam Mayor and Police Commissioner in extending my deepest, deepest sympathies to the Gray family. Our mission at the direction of the Police Commissioner is and has always been without prejudice, partiality, to seek the truth and uncover the facts. And we are committed to do that. As you may know, my Bureau investigates all major uses of force by officers, or as in this case, any in-custody death resulting from officers' actions. I want to make it very clear. We go wherever the facts, wherever the evidence take us, and we will do that again. We will do so while demonstrating as much transparency as possible without compromising the investigation or violating any of the laws. There is a lot of misinformation in public, as has been stated earlier. We want to clear up some of the confusions that may exist, and in doing so, we're going to walk you through the timeline of events that led to Mr. Gray's loss of life. We also want to share with you the progress in the investigation, our timeline, our completion due date, and how we're working in partnership with the state's attorney's office. We also want to share with you that the current state status of the involved officers as we have been able to interview and determine them is that they are currently suspended. As we walk you through the, uh, the timeline to date, I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that are out there. First of all, we're going to show you the closed circuit TV that the police department has. And I want, I want you all to listen to what I'm about to say. It is our video that has been unedited, that is raw, we are not in the business of hiding facts. 
we will show you that video and provide you with a copy of it. We will be looking specifically at our actions from the point that we came into contact with Mr. Gray up until the time that we requested medical assistance. Specifically, did we miss any warnings? Should we have acted sooner? Should we have acted in any different manner? As was discussed earlier, the autopsy was done today. And as we have stated before, that we had no evidence, physical or video or statements, of any use of force. There was no physical bodily injury that we saw, nor was it evident in the autopsy of Mr. Gray. None of his limbs were broken. He did suffer a very tragic injury to his spinal cord, which resulted in his death. What we don't know and what we need to get to is how that injury occurred. We want to get there, but we want to do it very carefully, very thorough, and get to the truth of the matter. As the investigation stands today, we have interviewed all of those involved. We have two individuals that we need to interview. As we stated earlier, we're working with the medical examiners. I had folks from my bureau investigators, homicide experts at the uh, examination today with the ME's office. And our goal, our promise to you is that that investigation will be done by a week from this Friday and we will submit it in its entirety to the district attorney's office for their review. At that point, we will work uh, to provide any additional information that they may ask for, if any, in order to help them come to the conclusion. I believe we have a couple of, uh, let's show the CCTV cameras. To the right. I know, there's a billboard there with the. Again, you will all be getting a copy of this video. It's important to note that our CCTV is in a pan mode unless it is controlled by an individual. At this point it was not. And that's why you see portions where the video scans may come back around, but by that time several seconds could have passed. The only time the video will focus on a particular location or person or corner is if the investigator or the officer at the other side of the camera physically takes control of that camera and stops it from rotating. We have only the very best equipment. It'll catch on here in just a second. But it was important for, for us not only to show you that video today, uh, to dispel, quite honestly, the rumors that have been put out there, but we're going to give you a copy of it. Uh, and again, that's right from our, our cameras. We have many of the other same videos that you have, that you have seen, uh, the ones that were taken from different vantage points by members in the community. As soon as that's over, I will walk you through the timeline. This is the only one that, that I am aware of that we know that we have found uh, that has captured any of the incident, and it was very little, of, of our CCTV cameras. I don't know the exact, uh, we, we provided everything that was on there. You're going to get a copy of it. We're going to have a copy for all of you. But there are other cameras There's uh, approximately 600 cameras, over 600 cameras citywide. Yes, ma'am. 
Uh, I'll get that information uh, for you. What corner is it? Lieutenant, do you know what corner that is? 16, How many do we have in that corner? Say that again, please. So there's only one camera on that corner. We have over 600 citywide. So, so the others on Bruce Sports uh, Project were operational? That is correct. We have, say that again. Which is closer that, we only have one camera that captured any of it, and that was this camera here. And we'll answer some of those specifics after, afterwards. Lieutenant, what's the exact corner of this camera? This camera is 1,600 miles forward. Okay, that's cross street is. Let me go through the, uh, the timeline so you understand the, the locations. Lieutenant, give us the exact corner of this camera again. 1,600 miles forward. Do you have the cross street or no? There's also a camera at Mount and Baker. And we went to so we'll get you that information once we're done. Okay. He just has the, the address. He doesn't have the cross. Street. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to go through the, uh, the timeline. And you have had a copy of this timeline before. I'm going to elaborate a little bit more. This incident occurred at approximately 0839 in 12 seconds at North and Mount. The reason we give these specific times is because we could validate this time because there is something that was either keyed or said on the police radio that has a time stamp on it. There's how we can attribute a time to it. A lieutenant begins uh, pursuing Mr. Gray after making eye contact with two individuals, one of which is Mr. Gray. Both males take off running southbound from that direction. At approximately 0839.52, at 1700 Pressbury, two blocks south of North and Mount, one of the units gets on there, said the address, and states, I got him. At 8.40 and 12 seconds, a unit states, we've got one, and confirms the address of 1700 Press Street case, or Press Street. He has stopped Gray at this time. The information we have is that Mr. Gray gave up without the use of force. There was an officer that was attempting to uh, stop Officer Gray that took his taser out preparatory to using it, but never deployed the taser. That has been verified by downloading the information on the taser and also by the physical evidence on Mr. Gray's body, the lack of taser deployment. At 8.42 and 52 seconds, a wagon is requested for transport. At that point, Mr. Gray asks for an inhaler. At approximately 08.46 and 2 seconds, the driver of the van, of the transport van, believes that Mr. Gray is acting irate in the back. At about 8.46 and 12 seconds, at Mount and Baker, one block to the south and east, a unit asks the wagon to stop so that the paperwork can be completed. And at that point, Gray is placed in leg irons and put back in the wagon. We have several witnesses from the community that we have interviewed with regards to this particular stop. At approximately 8.54 and 2 seconds, the wagon clears Mount Street heading towards Central Booking, going southbound. Approximately five minutes elapse. And at 8.59 and 52 seconds, there's a request at Druid Hill and Dolphin, which is east of Mount and Baker. The person driving the van asks for an additional unit to check on his prisoner. That is Mr. Gray. Part of what our investigation will do, there is no video of these stops, 
is to identify exactly what was going on, what was said by Mr. Gray, what was relayed by the officers, and what actions, if any, we took or what actions we should have taken. At 1600 North Avenue at Pennsylvania, which is east of Dolphin and Druid Hill, there is this, uh, another arrest and there's a, a request for a wagon. The wagon leaves. Before the wagon leaves, there's some communication with Mr. Gray. And again, we need to assess Mr. Gray's condition, how we responded, were we able to uh, act accordingly. At that point, they travel to the Western District with the individual that's in the, the wagon, the other suspect, in addition to Mr. Gray. Once they get to the Western District, at approximately 0924 and 32 seconds is when a medic is called. We know the injuries that Mr. Gray sustained. We know the final outcome of Mr. Gray is unfortunately he passed away. What we don't have at this point is how Mr. Gray sustained those injuries. We are working tirelessly as the commissioner stated, we have appointed folks to our task force that will work solely on this. We will work, continue to work closely with the state's attorney's office to get to the, the fact, to get to the truth. We have also plotted here on this map the various stops. We could also provide that to you. With that, if there are any other questions. The video, which many of you have seen, a lot of you have seen, I've seen many times, doesn't depict, at least clearly to us, and we're, we're working on getting those videos uh, augmented so that we can have a better uh, view of what's going on there, but it's difficult to see. Uh, I can't sit here and tell you that I see a knee on Mr. Gray's back. Did the officer no. Uh, no, absolutely not. Uh, none of the officers describe None of the officers describe any use of force. Uh, none of the officers describe using any force against Mr. Gray. Do you Considering the change in the van? I'll tell you what I do know, and, and right now there's still a lot of questions I don't know. I know that when Mr. Gray was placed inside that van, he was able to talk, he was um, upset, and when Mr. Gray was taken out of that van, uh, he could not talk and he could not breathe. Considering the change in policy, Yes. At what point? That's what we're trying to, to specify now. Who were the two officers not interviewed? I never said they were officers. Uh, there's two, um, two individuals from the fire department that we still need to interview. Did you, do you think that either something happened in the van that has been whiplash, or do you think this injury was responsible of another human? Listen, I, I, um, I am deeply troubled by this. Uh, we all want to know but I can't answer what I don't know. I know Mr. Gray suffered a very traumatic injury, uh, but I don't know if it happened prior to him getting into the van or while he was in the van. Uh, I don't know. Was there somebody in the van with him in the back? No, Mr. Gray was the only one on that side of the van, and it wasn't until the very end that another suspect was placed in the van uh, who we have interviewed. Uh, but that suspect was on, a, on the other side of a metal barrier with no contact with Mr. Gray. He could hear Mr. Gray, but he could not see him. Is there, is there a video inside the van? And I have witnesses who say that Mr. Gray was, was telling him that he was asthmatic at the time, was having trouble breathing. As I stated earlier, Mr. Gray early on asked for his inhaler, uh, which he did, not, he did not have with him. Uh, he was asked that. So that, that is correct. That's correct. Is there any video inside the 
There is no video recordings. That's one of the things the commissioner has already changed. Uh, we're looking at a lot of things. Uh, one of the things is to make sure that uh, whenever an individual uh, appears even in the slightest to be in medical emergency or medical distress that we immediately provide them with medical attention. Going back to the initial stop, when you talk about having made, the officer having made eye contact with Gray and maybe another individual on the scene, um, we still have not gotten anything. I mean, court documents outlined a little bit that um, he was running unprovoked, but what was the initial cause for the arrest? Is there, has there been any de development there? Uh, the, the bottom line, too, is that we don't have an answer to it. As the report states, is that the officers made eye contact and uh, he ran and officers pursued. So part of the investigation is digging deeper into that to see if there was anything more than that that you have already. And would that necessitate putting handcuffs on him and placing him under arrest because he ran? That's part of the, the question that we have to dig into and look and see exactly if there's more that was there. Uh, just running, there is no there is no law against running. You've conducted a number, you've conducted a number of investigations thus far, yet you still have a lot of the not being the, I feel that the officers are giving their, their information based uh, on the statements. Uh, there's some things that, um, uh, much like the medical examiner said today, is that we may not know the answers to all the questions. Uh, my job it, right now is to drive investigations to answer as many as we possibly can. Uh, to answer the questions, was there a knee on the back, to enlarge the video to, to see and slow it down to see if we can see those things, and do everything we possibly can to answer all the questions that we can. There may be just certain questions out there that we may not have the answer to. Let me just clarify something about that. When I asked the question, did he seek request of medical attention, you said yes. Is that, are you referring to when he asked for the inhaler? Did there, he there, was, after that? there was several times that uh, we should have clicked to uh, getting medical request. He asked for the inhaler as he was going into. At uh, one or two of the stops, uh, it was noticed that he was having a little trouble breathing where we should have probably asked for uh, paramedics or had him look at it at that time. Commissioner, if there had been body cameras on these officers in this case, is it your opinion that this would have happened at all? And second, given what's going on in the city, I know you want to put the pilot program in later this year with the full program potential sometime next year. Would you prefer to speed that process up given what's happening? Well, you, you know, as I've shared before, is that I was at one of the first police agencies five years ago to start uh, body cameras. I am a proponent of body ca cameras. I also think they're not a panacea to, to the solution to everything. And I'm not going to speculate on if, the, if uh, this would have happened or not. Uh, we are going to move forward. We have put out an RFP for body cameras. We are going to start a, a pilot program before the end of the year. And I just want to add to that that it's clear that what happened happened inside the van. And uh, it's, we don't have any procedure that would have an officer riding in the back of the van with uh, the, uh, the suspects. So even if the officers had body cameras, it would not cover that, that period of time. So now are we thinking about potentially putting something inside the van also? Is that That's what, the I think he's already said that twice, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that, that, is, that is exactly uh, what we're looking at at this point in time. We do have cameras that are, that are in vans, but it's just the, for the driver to see what's in the back. I would uh, like to have those recorded, so we're moving very quickly to see how we can connect those and bring them online. So you're suggesting that this happened in the van, there was not an officer in the van, therefore this was medically induced? I don't think we're suggesting anything. Right, right now we have to go through the medical examiner in having them uh, submit their final report, and we'll take it from that point. That's their expertise. Currently, there are six officers that are suspended. How many are subject to potential criminal That you have to, uh, at this point in time, we're just doing an investigation. The state's attorney will take it from that point in time and, and see if there's any officers at all. We don't know if any are, are open to investigation. That's her responsibility. Did you want to answer the question? I'm sorry, ma'am. No, no. He ran when he saw the police. So let's let's take it from the beginning. Okay. Uh, the officers what is were, were deployed in an area that's called a hot spot because of the high crime area. Uh, there is a lot of narcotics activity there. Uh, the information we have is that the officers saw. Uh, and by the way, there's three officers on a bike, not four. Uh, there's three officers on a bike. They see Mr. Gray and another 
uh, African-American male. They both start to run. Uh, they believed that Mr. Gray had either just committed or was committing a crime, and that's why he ran. And you have to understand, when I'm telling you this, I'm neither uh, validating, supporting, or rendering a decision. I'm merely stating the facts of what they gave us. Um, we don't have that. There was the three officers that initially made the contact with Mr. Gray that initiated the stop, but there's also a person who drove the wagon, and there's other officers that came into the scene uh, in, throughout this uh, time frame that we I laid out. I'll confirm this. Uh, I've been here two and a half years, and this city um, is unlike any other place, and I've had 30 years in law enforcement. Uh, this is a city that knows how to speak up, knows how to talk about injustices, but they do it in a very civil way. Uh, and I'm proud to be a part of this organization, and I'm proud that the members of our community speak up. Uh, this is not Ferguson. This is a city where we've worked very hard under this current administration to develop uh, dialogue with the community, uh, and we're here to say that we hear you, we understand uh, the frustration, uh, but our custom here in Baltimore is to work together towards a solution. As per policy uh, in um, the state, they're on suspension with pay, and that's per the law. And back to your, your earlier question. Uh, I'm going to go walk out in that area. So I'm going to go out and touch bases with our residents, our citizens, and make sure that we have support in that area and that we're listening to our community. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mayor. Thank, Thank you, Commissioner. So we have copies of the DVDs for everyone. Everyone that still needs a copy, if you can just hand back, we'll get everybody copies. Thank you very much. What's that? Thank you, Commissioner. There.